You're watching Bill on Bankruptcy. I'm Lee Pacquia. Bill Rochelle is out this week. Instead, we have a very special treat. Joining me now, I'm happy to say we have the unofficial dean of the bankruptcy bar, Harvey Miller, partner at Wild Gosh Hall. Welcome back. Good to see you again. Good to see you. So last week, of course, the city of Detroit filed a Chapter 9 bankruptcy petition after decades of compounding economic troubles. You put together the papers for the city of New York's bankruptcy case. Of course, it didn't file, but uh, it, it, it got really close. When you learned that Detroit was going to file for bankruptcy, what did you think? It was something that should have been expected. Uh, it's been 40 years of, I would say, something like benign neglect of a problem that kept getting larger and larger and larger. And it's a problem of cities all around the United States, but this is much more aggravated, much more aggravated. And of course, we should point out that your firm is representing the bond insurers in this case. Um, let's I can't, I can't affirm or deny that. I'm not aware of it. Okay. Let's cover some basics. Why do we treat governments differently under the bankruptcy code? Why do we have a Chapter 9 in the first place? It's such a strange creature. Well, first, you have to take into account that this is a, uh, a government that's made up of states and a federal government. And there's a little thing called the Tenth Amendment to the Constitution, which preserves and protects the sovereign rights of the state. And cities are subdivisions of a state. Chapter 9 came about really because of the Great Depression. Uh, during the 30s, there were many, many cities that were unable to service their debt. And when the Chandler Act was adopted in 1938, it included a Chapter 9 provision. Initially, when it first got to the Supreme Court, it was declared unconstitutional as a violation of the Tenth Amendment. And then there was an, a, a really minor amendment. Mm -hmm. And it went back to Congress. It was passed, and the Supreme Court upheld it. And there were a number of cities that went into Chapter 9 in the 30s. And in fact, if I recall correctly, Asbury Park, New Jersey, That's right. was in Chapter 9 for almost 35 years. Hmm. Not, not a quick exit. <laughs> no, not a quick exit. Not at all. Practically speaking, what do you consider some of the key differences between a Chapter 9 restructuring and a Chapter 11 restructuring? Chapter 11? Chapter 11 is basically a deleveraging technique. And if it doesn't work and the creditors don't like it, you liquidate the debtor, correct? You can't liquidate a city. Chapter 9 does not provide for liquidation, nor can the court direct the city to do anything in terms of revenue raising, uh, the, what you, I would call the political end of government. Courts can't interfere with that. So you, you get to the issue of what is the problem that it's affecting the city and how do you cure it? Now, if you look at prior Chapter 9 cases, Orange County, Orange County was the result of alleged fraud. And uh, once you corrected that, there was an economic base upon which you could do a plan of adjustment mm -hmm. in which people compromised and there were discounts and so on. The interesting thing about Orange County, the original plan of adjustment depended upon a, I think it was a 0.5% increase in the sales tax to finance the payments under the plan. And that had to go to the voters and the voters turned it down. What, in your opinion, is the primary problem facing the Detroit case? I mean, there are a lot of issues out there that the media is handling, but as a restructuring advisor, well, without, who's primary? Without getting into the legal issues, the economic issues are overwhelming. You have a city that at one time, if I recall correctly, was a city with the largest number of single household owners, primarily connected to the manufacturing uh, phase of our country or sector. You had a city of two, two, two million people, and you're now down to 700,000. Of that 700,000, how many of those people have full-time have full employment? Mm -hmm. You have an outgoing migration of people who don't want to bear the tax burden and are leaving the area. Uh, and you don't have any real economic base within the city limits. Mm. I had a wise bankruptcy professor that used to say that bankruptcy courts are where society ultimately decides what's important. Let's get metaphysical here. At the center of the case, there's essentially um, three elements that are triangulated. How does a fair and just society weigh bondholder debt against pension debt, against taxpayers' obligation and willingness to pay? That's a 
that's a tricky, tricky problem. Well, pensions and labor issues are always very sensitive in bankruptcy. And it's even more sensitive in pensions because, at least theoretically, you can say people extended their services in consideration of getting these pensions uh, and retirement benefits, and now they live on that. And if you take those away, what, what happens to these people? So there is an issue of what is the equitable thing to do. But unfortunately, in the bankruptcy law, there is no difference between a rejected pension, when I say rejected, breached pension, and a general unsecured claim. Mm -hmm. So is there going to be some special treatment for the pensioners? I mean, I, I think I saw an article by Steve Ratner saying you've you got to do something for the pensioners. And a lot of people believe that. Then you have the general obligation bonds, you have special pledged revenues. All of these are tremendous problems that have to be ironed out. Mm. What do you suppose is going to be the long-term impact on the municipal bond markets? Are they going to be forever spooked from a case like this? Well, the, un the underlying thought was always that cities would not take advantage of Chapter 9 because they would never have the ability to access the credit markets again. Uh, I'm not so sure that's valid. I think it makes it more difficult to access the credit markets. But if you have a multitude of cities that do take advantage of Chapter 9, which is not a pleasant process, credit markets are very pragmatic. Mm -hmm. And if there are bonds that are being offered or whatever it may be that are su supported by a good economic plan and a decent yield, I think they'll be able to access the markets in the long run. Mm. Turning over to the public employee pension side, uh, do you see any new law coming out uh, in that, that area? No, not really. The question is how, how, the court, how is the plan, if there ever is a plan, is going to treat pension claims? Mm -hmm. And will other creditors complain? You know, very much like in Chapter 11, you have classification. You could have a class, if everybody agrees to it, that takes care of the pension use. Mm. When I first saw uh, the news of this case uh, break over the wires, uh, one of the things that came to my mind was we're probably going to see some unconventional urban planning proposals coming out of this case. Do you expect to see any? I think that may be a potential solution because you have vast areas of Detroit which are really essentially uninhabited mm -hmm. but require city services. And something's got to be done with that. It's a very, Michigan's a very peculiar place. In Detroit, you pass, I think it's Nine Mile Island, and you like pass out of one kind of a country into another kind of country. And something has to be done within Wayne County. I think Wayne County encompasses everything to deal with this problem of whether you, you can't have a subdivision that has two homes and the rest of the subdivision is gone and you have to furnish fire, police, sanitation, et cetera. Mm. Looking at this situation, a lot of people are trying to figure out if this is something that's particular to the city of Detroit or if this is really a nationwide problem. What do you think? Are we going to see more large cities file Chapter 9 in the near term? It all depends on the problems. I mean, if you look at other Chapter 9 cases, Jefferson County, a peculiar problem with the sewage bonds. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at other Chapter 9s, they're particular problems. This is a very general problem. Mm. This is, a, and like a Chapter 11, which you are familiar with, is there a reorganizable unit here? That's going to be the big issue. And there's going to be a lot of legal fighting in this. You know, one third of all Chapter 9 petitions are dismissed. Right, right. A, a lot of people are trying to figure out whether this case is going to get dismissed in, in the near term. How long, if it, assuming it doesn't, how long do you expect this restructuring to take? Is it going to be like Asbury Park where it's 35 years? Well, or? under Chapter 9, as it's now on the books, the judge fixes the time when they have to file a plan. And if they don't file a plan within that fixed period of time, the option is to dismiss the case. But I don't know how you dismiss the case without some solution to the problems. Mm -hmm. And it's not strictly a deleveraging problem. All right, and if we put you in a judge's robe right now, what number would you come up with? That's got to be an awfully difficult conversation to have in chambers. Uh, it should be in courtroom. But putting that aside, uh, it's going to be a long case. Very interesting. Harvey, thank you so much for coming Please, by. It's to always talk good to see us. you. Likewise. Thank you. That's Harvey Miller from the law firm Wild Gottschall. If you'd like to learn more about the cases and issues we just discussed, be sure to go check out our offerings on BloombergLaw.com and also on the Bloomberg Terminal. You can see more of our videos on YouTube, and you can follow our updates on Twitter. I'm Lee Pacquiao. Thanks for watching.